Hello, everybody online. It's great that you're with us today. Who has wounded you? Who has lied about you? Who has betrayed you? Who has walked out on you? Who has taken your money? Who has gossiped? about you? Who abused you when you were younger? Who has been ungrateful and even humiliated you in front of others? Who said things about you or to you that were incredibly painful? Do you have their name in your mind? Hold on to it. Now, I know that for some of you, this is like pulling off a scab. But I want you to follow along and listen to the most radical words ever to come out of somebody's mouth. Now, these are words that are probably familiar with you if you've been a part of the church for any length of time. But because they're so familiar, they may have lost their power in your life. Now, as I read this famous passage from the Bible, I want you to think about who has wounded you. Who is that person? Do you have them in your mind? And while you think about them... That person. I want you to think of something else when I read this scripture. I want you to think about what it would be like to live in an occupied country and your property and your possessions have been taken away from you and you have been rejected by family members and all because you believe that an itinerant preacher is in fact the Messiah, the promised God-man that you've heard about. You just knew <laughs> that you needed to listen to him. You simply could not not follow him. And as a result, everything from being walked into the Roman Colosseum to be killed, you knew good friends that ha this happened to to being excommunicated from your Jewish family and friends. This happened to your next door neighbor. To being maligned and, and, uh, maligned and abused by your own neighborhood. That happened to your family. To losing out on commerce, the ability to make a living and to have social interactions. That happened to you. This is what Jesus would say to them, and this is what Jesus says to you, to us. If you have your Bibles, you can turn in Matthew chapter 5. It's in the famous Sermon on the Mount, right in the middle. Has Jesus got your attention? You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor... And hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He 
Our Father in heaven causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus is telling us that this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And to be a mature follower of Jesus, you are to be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, do you think that's possible? I am, you may be saying to yourself, I am surrendered to him, Rich. I've given him all. I've given him my heart. I've given him all that I am. I have surrendered myself to him. I have separated myself from the world. But it is impossible what you are asking. And paradoxically, if you don't think it's impossible, what happens then is that you keep on trying with your own willpower to do more and more and better and better and gooder and gooder. <laughs> and the people that really work hard at being gooder, they're the Pharisees. And they didn't fare so well in Jesus' eyes. Now, Paul's intention of writing Romans chapter 12, and we've been in it now for a month, was not to motivate you and me to have a stronger moral code. Romans 12 is a profile of what, it's a picture or a snapshot of what happens to a person when they experience mercy and grace and love of God that Paul describes in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And then we get here to chapter 12. And Paul is teaching us to focus our efforts, focus our hearts on relationships. In other words, he says, if you want to be perfect, as Jesus has called us to be perfect, then you will focus on relationships. You're going to spend a lot less time focusing on yourself, and you're going to spend a lot more time focusing on people. Now, Paul is not jettisoning. He's not meaning to imply that rules and religious activities don't matter. That's not what he's doing. If you know Paul, read his epistles, you know that he's a big guy on doing things the right way. But the focus of any rule or religious activity that we engage in is to cultivate and to enhance our relationship with God the Father and our relationships with one another. And so, if we were to sum up Romans chapter 12 in one little sentence, we would sum it up with these words. Our highest aim as followers of Christ is, what was that? Love. Our highest aim as followers of Christ is love. Now, Paul is a smart guy, and he's writing to people in the city of Rome who are part of a nation of Rome, the nation of Rome. They had a certain amount of pride, a certain amount of arrogance. They were in the epicenter of the universe. And he breaks it down in the simplest possible terms. Our highest aim is love. Now, remember when Jesus himself was confronted, and they asked him, what is the most important commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God. How? With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he says, love your neighbors as yourself. Our highest aim is love. And over the last four weeks, with Lisa's help, we've been breaking down Romans chapter 12. In the very first verse, we learn that loving God 
is what he wants most from us. He wants us to be all in. Love God, love God, love God. That's it. Love God. That's what God wants the most. Then he says, in verse 2, he says, refuse to love the world. So, you see, there's a competition for your love. And the world wants to seduce your heart away from love of God. The world wants to convince you that it's okay for you to have a lust of the flesh and a lust of the eyes and a pride of life and that it's perfectly fine for you to pursue those things. And that when you pursue those things, you will experience real success and real relationships and real significance and real love. But Paul is saying that's, they've got, we, the world's got it backwards. If you are going to experience real love, you need to separate your heart your ability to love from loving the world's systems. And he even goes so far as to say in verse 2, he says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him or her. Does Jesus have your attention? Then in verses 3 through 8, I love this. He says, love for self is very important. Loving self is when you look in the mirror and you say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. A hundred years ago, I was fearfully, over a hundred years ago, because there's that nine-month gestation period. Over a hundred years ago, Daryl, the Lord fearfully and wonderfully made you. And then when we look in the mirror of our souls and we say, I am forgiven, I'm adopted, I'm a child of the King, and I have received treasured gifts from the Holy Spirit because I am His affection. I am in Christ, and God the Father looks at me through the eyes of looking at the Son and so Paul encourages us in these verses 3 through 8 to have a sober self-assessment to really understand how you are loved. The detritus of sin, that shame that we hold on to, doesn't need to be held on to. We are loved by the God of the universe. And then last week we talked about how important it is for that love that we have to be poured out on others and to do it sacrificially. Loving God, not loving the world, loving yourself, and then loving the family of God, the body of Christ, by radically serving one another with a heart of love. Well, today we're going to be talking about loving your enemies. And he clearly tells us that this is how we are supposed to respond to evil. So, he starts with an instruction by saying that you respond to that person that you have in your mind. Can you think of that person? Bring that person to the front of your mind. And listen to what he says in Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. You want to go to the next slide? This is what he says, that person that is right there in your mind. I have one. I have one right there. It's a guy. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And then he goes on to say, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace 
with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So how should we respond to evil? First and foremost, right out of the blocks, bless them that persecute you, that person that's right in the front of your mind. When we've been hurt, and if you're a living, breathing human being, and if you've lived any length of time in your life, you've been hurt by another human being, period. And it's very likely that you've been hurt devastatingly bad, period. Some of the hurt that we carry around is almost unspeakable. Paul is, re is, is responding to the gospel message that Jesus gave on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, bless them that persecute you. Now Paul is spiritually mature. And he tells us that to be spiritually mature... When we bless those who persecute us, we will experience a supernatural result. When you act the way Jesus acted toward his enemies, because Jesus lives in you by his spirit, and you do it in the power of what you learn in the word of God, we're learning what we're supposed to do. Bless those who persecute you. In the context of authentic community, which we talked about last week, we are not supposed to go it alone. There's something powerful about being part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And, oh, I could spend a lot of time talking about that. I just read a fantastic book about marriage and weaved all the way through it was this idea that the marriages that we have are a reflection of the love that Christ has for his bride, the church, even though the church is fully messed up most of the time. Paul says, do not be overcome by evil. That's the supernatural result. Now, what is it like to bless those who persecute you? I want to draw your attention to a story in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 24. If you have your Bibles on your app, pull it out. Take a look at it with me. I just want to briefly share this story with you. So, blessing people who do evil is when you do good for them and they know deep in their heart and in their mind and their psyche that they don't deserve it. And it brings about a sense of shame, even in the heart and mind of the person who does the evil. Now, there's a picture that I want to show you about David. So David is the new anointed king of Israel. There's a problem, though. There's another king in his place right now. His name is Saul. And originally, Saul had a great deal of respect for David. But because Saul was, he was, he was not, you could even use the term, he wasn't, born again. He wasn't spiritually mature. He, he didn't really yield his heart to the lordship of God. He was jealous of David, and it happened very, very soon, he, even to the point where there were many times where he tried to kill David. Well, fast forward to 1 Samuel 24, and David is going around Israel, and he's actually defeating Israel's enemies on behalf of King Saul and the nation. He's doing good for King Saul, but Saul is afraid of David, and he's afraid to give up his power, his role, his authority, his identity as king. And so he gathers 3,000 of his best fighting men, chosen fighting men, 3,000 of them, and they go looking for David. And they, they don't find David. David and his, merry, his, merry, his band of merry men, <laughs> they have, they have um, gone into a cave must be a fairly decent-sized cave. And Saul <laughs> goes into the cave to relieve himself. I like how the Bible doesn't pull punches. Now, the men notice what's going on, so they move all the way to the very back of the cave where it's really, really dark, and they're afraid. 
because they know that there are 3,000 men out there to kill them. And they whisper to David, David, this is the time. You have him in your grasp. You should kill him now. You would be fulfilling the prophecy that has been given to you. Now, it doesn't exactly describe exactly how this happened, but Saul was otherwise disposed. I would guess he was going one and two. <laughs> and his robe is in a position where David can get to it, and he cuts off a little corner of his robe. Saul takes care of his business, heads out of the cave, heads down the ravine over to his camp, and David goes out to the front of the cave. Psalm 1, uh, 1 Samuel 24. And his men, they wanted him to kill King Saul because King Saul has done him wrong. Devastatingly, amazingly, turned the people of Israel against him. He had his band of men, and that was it. Falsely accused. He has literally had his life almost snuffed out by this king on a number of occasions. And David lets him go because he says that it is not for me to avenge what has been done wrong. And the response from Saul, he weeps. Because in that moment, in that instant, the supernatural experience was that he repented. He understood who he was in the light of eternity, in the light of who God is, and in the goodness of God, and he recognized how evil he was. Now, it was a very short-term repentance, <laughs> and he, uh, he went back on his normal way of doing things. But what does it look like to bless those who persecute you? David said to his men, and he said to Saul himself, it is not for me to avenge. That is jo God's job. Lisa's going to come up, and she's going to talk about some specific things that we can do. How do we overcome the evil that's aimed at us? We know that we are to bless those who persecute us. And Jesus says, pray for those. But what does that mean for us? I mean, we know what praying for, what is blessing, what does that mean? And so she's going to talk about how to give good in place of evil. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. So over the last several weeks, we have received good things from God. Wonderful. We have practiced the things of God. We have owned how God has made us. And we have shown up for God's people and authentic community. It's disheartening when we see prominent Christian celebrities. Most recently this week, Kevin Max Smith, formerly of DC Talk, has rejected and renounced his faith. And it's largely impacted by the behavior of the church as a whole. And I believe that this should give us, the church, pause for self-examination to our behavior. Are we looking for the attention of man to acknowledge our goodness? Or are we truly reflecting Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, full of compassion and love, Humble to acknowledge that we are at the will of the Father. To bring us back to the context of Romans, we need to hold on to the reminders laid out in chapters 1 through 11 of our humanness, our inability to save ourselves, and that it is only by God's mercy that we are seen as Christ is seen. Recalling verse 9, love must be sincere. Anything else is shallow pride rooted in ungodliness. Today we will love. Roxanne reminded us today during open worship that we are loved. And let us remember that when we love others, we can only do that because God loves us 
and he lives inside of us and fills us with his love. We start with loving our enemies, as Rich has talked about. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. I know Pastor Rich already read it, but I don't think it's a bad idea to read God's word twice. I'm grateful that he helped us to think about people who may have hurt us as our potential enemies. I think that the word enemy is a little strong. I don't think any of us really have a, uh, like a Saul in our life, somebody who's trying to hunt us down and kill us. I, I hope not, that that is not the case for you. And it, again, it's more likely that we just have people we don't like very much in our life. Maybe it's the in-law who is constantly criticizing you. How about the coworker who keeps stealing your ideas? Maybe it's the neighbor who keeps letting their dog use your yard as their restroom. How about the classmate who is uh, constantly picking on you? Or the employee that constantly challenges what you have to say? We have many in our life that we would not call our friends. So what do we do with those who are not our friends, otherwise known as our enemies? A few years ago, Bob and I were camp counselors, and the week of teaching was all about forgiveness. The tagline was, forgiveness is the key between you and me, me and me, and God and me. When we forgive our enemies, it releases them from us, moving our focus from the, the hurt that they have caused us to the freedom that God gives us. What does it look like for me to serve and bless my enemies? I'm sure by now you have thought of a few people on your list of difficult people in your life list. I challenge you today to pray for them. If you are praying for your enemy, that's step number one, pray for them. Seek out their well-being. Meet a physical need they have. Those are listed on your bulletin as well, so you can have, have that as a reminder for you as you go into your week. Our love is also not a private matter. We must love out loud. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If I try to do what is right in the eyes of everyone, isn't this people-pleasing? Going against the message of the world, which tells us that our own way is the right way, Paul again challenges us here that we are to aim to be at peace with everyone. Not just like-minded people, not just the people in your household, not just the people in your church, not just your neighbors, everyone. You may be familiar with the quote, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. But I am actually not a fan of this quote because I believe that the call of the gospel is that we are challenged to live our faith out loud in both our actions and our words. So do you reach across the comfortable boundaries that you have of your community? I think about Peter in Acts 10. He was so devout to his traditions and customs of his Jewish heritage that it took a vision by God three times to tell him to go and associate with the Gentiles. And this was a very pivotal moment because this is when the way of Jesus crossed the Jewish boundary line into the Gentile community when Cornelius and his family accepted the way of Jesus. I'm personally really grateful for that moment. After all, it was Jesus who associated with tax collectors, Samaritans, sinners, and so on, so on, so on. He showed us how to build relationships with those outside of our circles. 
By living your faith publicly for the sake of living at peace with everyone speaks the love of God to the world. So what social, racial, or lifestyle boundaries is it time to cross that you felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to just start having conversation and relationships with people? Where have you been holding back? And when you have those conversations, bring Jesus with you into the conversation. Often, people share about things going on in their life and their struggles. Pray with them. Offer right then and there. Thanks for sharing that with me. Can I pray with you right now? Most people, regardless of their faith, I, I can assure you most people will accept that opportunity to pray right then. And if they decline, that's okay. You can let them know, I'm going to be praying for you this week, and then do. And then in the future, they're going to know you're a safe person to go and that they can go and talk to about things that they're struggling with. Finally, we have a call to love globally. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. I tricked you. We, we went into chapter 13. When we read a chapter and verse in the Bible, we must remember that these distinctions of these numbers were not there when this was originally written. This was a letter, all written as one text. Anyone who's seen superhero movies knows that good wins over evil every time. However, battling aliens with a roundhouse kick is not yet something in my skill set. Paul's encouragement is that while there is evil in the world, we can be actionable to overcome that evil. We don't have to lie down and allow evil to rule in our hearts, our minds, or our communities. We overcome the darkness in our world by recognizing that all authority is established by God. This doesn't mean that all authorities are godly and righteous. We know that is not the case. What it does mean is we have an obligation as Christ followers to respect our leaders, even if we disagree with them, to pray for them, and to live at peace in our divided world. It all comes back to verse 9, that love from the center of who you are. John 13, 34, and 35 Jesus tells his disciples to love one another. As I have loved you, so love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. Do we let love reign on social media? Do we let love reign when we disagree with our friends? Do we let love reign when an election doesn't go our way, or when it does? Do we encourage love, or do we encourage our own way? If you don't already, I encourage you to make it a practice of praying for our government leaders. They have great responsibility to lead and make policies. They need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to move for God's glory to be displayed. I also challenge you to continue reading Romans 13 through 16. And then when you're finished with 16, go back to chapter 1. And read the whole thing again. Embrace that grace that God has given us. And as a final advanced challenge for each of you today, I encourage you to get the book Respectable Sins. I've mentioned it a few times, and this is on probably my top three books other than the Bible that has been transformative personally for me. And I challenge you to read it over the summer. They have it in audio as well. And when you finish it, let me know and let's talk about it. I'd love to hear how it impacted you. To close, sometimes Christianity feels really far away, like we aren't good enough to keep up, or we don't know enough. I look forward to writing more about this topic on my personal blog, Head and Heart Space, and I do hope that you'll continue to, to follow that line there and continue dialogue with me on it. Paul's practicality of explaining the nitty-gritty here in Romans 12 is refreshing, honest, and revealing. I venture to say that Paul could speak so well from it because these are places that he struggled with himself and wrestled through these topics as we have here today. So I encourage you to press on, brothers and sisters. We're in really good company on this journey. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Can we give Lisa a hand for helping me out? 
she has done a great job, and we're, we're making plans to do this again uh, probably next year. But, um, and we have other wonderful messages coming your way that aren't from my lips. So I'm excited about how God is moving in our church and among our fellowship. But the crux of the matter is that God wants us to love our enemies. And we love our enemies for our good and for God's glory. Now I want to ask you something. Can you imagine what would happen to us in this room? And for those of you who are online, if we said, you know what? If Sherwood and the greater Portland area is ever going to be reconciled, if it's ever going to be reached, if it's ever going to experience God's grace and mercy, it probably won't happen through religious activities. But what if we really Loved our enemies. As Paul instructs, as David modeled for us, and as Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. So, assignment. I learned that word yesterday in that conference. Your assignment. What if everybody here, everybody online, you walked out these doors, you walked out the doors of your house, and you went to that person, if that person is still here, and said, I'm going to forgive so-and-so. And then... What if you started on a journey praying for them? And then, what if you did something nice for them? That's your assignment this week. It's a hard one. I have some work to do. And I will report to you next week how it went. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the scripture that we received from Paul 2,000 years ago. And he was impacted directly and miraculously by the person of Jesus Christ in a way that we haven't. It wasn't a, a spiritual apparition. It wasn't a, a Holy Spirit vision. It was the present, li living, resurrected Jesus. And he, because of that, is an apostle. We can trust his authority. And he gives us these instructions on how to be a mature follower of Christ, and in a simple sentence, our highest aim is love. And I know, Father, we cannot love somebody if we have not forgiven them. Help us this week, by your Holy Spirit, to be able to go out of this place and to forgive that person who has hurt us so desperately. And Father, we will look for the supernatural response of overcoming evil with good. And what does that do for the kingdom of God? For our good and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.